Thank you for being here. Good morning. Good morning. I hope all of you are doing well. I hope your school week has gone well so far. We had a great time in Acts this morning and looking forward to, to continuing that study as I know all the other faculty are really excited about getting started in their classes. So we're glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're here for chapel and for this special time that we have together. How many of you recognize this picture? <clears throat> okay. Um, so I'm assuming you've seen the movie Dead Poet Society, at least some of you have. Um, <clears throat> Robin Williams uh, is such a tragedy and loss uh, to, uh, to our cultural community. Uh, I really miss him. He was one of my uh, absolute favorite actors uh, in some of the things that he's done. Uh, and this movie in particular has always been really, um, really interesting to me uh, and, and has sort of uh, encouraged me to think in a lot of ways. There's a lot of complex themes in the movie. But if you'll remember at the beginning of the movie, and if you haven't seen it, I'll try to describe it as best I can. Uh, at the beginning of the movie, uh, this is uh, John Keating. He's the new professor in town, new English professor in town. And he has uh, been given his, his first class, and as they're in the classroom, uh, he's up at the front of the room, and everybody's sort of nervous, trying to figure out what's going to happen next, and he walks out the back door, and everybody's looking around at each other like, what's he doing? And he says, well, come on, and they all follow him, and he takes them to the, the foyer of uh, the high school that they have there. It's a private school. And in that foyer, they're looking at all the pictures on the wall. The high school you went to, I know, has the same thing. The trophy case out in the, out in the foyer. I, I, I don't know that I've ever been in one that doesn't have one. It's got a trophy case, and it's got pictures of the old sports teams and, and old, uh, older uh, um, memorabilia of, of times gone by. And, and uh, Keating brings all the students over to the trophy case. And as they stand around the trophy case, uh, he talks to them about the, the concept of carpe diem. And he gets them to focus in particularly on a, uh, an old photograph uh, of obviously black and white of people who were successful or, or came through the school that were just like the people standing there 15-year-olds 15 year old, 15 looking in the, in the case. And he says, he says, do you hear them? He says, lean in with me. So the whole class leans into the trophy case uh, and, uh, with Keating standing behind them. And, and as they lean in, they're all listening really attentively. And you hear, carpe, carpe, carpe diem. Seize the day, boys. Make your lives extraordinary. It's really powerful and interesting and touching uh, scene where the boys begin to realize that these two were just like them. And they had a life that has come and passed. And it's their time now to seize the day. What you may not know is that John Keating is modeled after a real guy. I found this fascinating. Uh, it was just happenstance that I stumbled across this article that was in our Times Daily back in the 80s. Um, I even searched for it on the internet today and I can't find it anymore, so I don't know how I found it in the first place, but the guy's name was Samuel Pickering. And what I find so fascinating about this is that Pickering didn't know or remember the student, who, Shulman, who grew up and wrote the screenplay for Dead Poet Society. He was at Montgomery Bell Academy in Nashville for one year as a teacher. And in that one year, he had a scrawny 15-year-old who developed and grew a love and passion for English and writing because of his crazy antics and the way that he went about just doing what he did, teaching. And so 
when Pickering gets older, his friends see the movie and recognize Pickering from the movie. And they ask him questions about it. And he says, how are y'all even recognizing me? He doesn't understand the change that he's made in this young guy's life that led to Dead Poet Society and then led to our enjoyment and entertainment in the movies. You may also recognize this little fella. He's around campus some. Uh, he goes by the name of Ethan Clark. Uh, he is the grandson of our own Alana Marks. And I found uh, this story really uh, wonderful and fascinating, and so much so that I've had to share it several times. Ethan went to a council meeting at his city council to try to convince the city council not to change the garbage service. The reason why he did that was that his garbage man was such an excellent garbage man and had such a, a developed relationship with him that it, it compelled Ethan to go and defend the man's job to the city council at the age of three, right? When the city council asked Ethan what would he do or what would happen if they did change the garbage service, his words were so profound to me. I would be so disappointed. Now, they changed the service anyway, but that's not the point. The, the heart and service of that garbage man changed a little boy's life. Just by doing his everyday duty in a different way, in an excellent way. Romans 12, 1 and 2, uh, you know, is way more than, than we could talk about today and way more than, than even I know about the passage as much as I've studied it. But one thing I do know is that transformation is real. I come into contact with so many people in my ministry and in my life who I believe think that people don't change. At least they say that. And they act like that. Well, it's, it's useless to try because this person's not going to change or I can't change or, or whatever. And the gospel doesn't make any sense if that's true. If we all buy into the house MD theory that everybody lies and nobody can change, then there is no transformation because that's what the word means. It means that we can change the essential form or nature of something. Now, more importantly, God can do that, um, particularly in this passage, but it takes some human cooperation for that sort of thing to happen. Now, what I find interesting and relevant and that I'd like to share with you today related to this is that that transformation comes through the agency of a renewal of mind. Do you see that? You're transformed by the renewing of your mind, or uh, some people would say in the renewing of your mind, if God is the agent here. But either way, that transformation comes by renewal of the mind. Now, I don't know how much you've ever thought about that, that concept of renewing your mind, but renewal here is the sense of becoming better or superior. Improvement is the idea when we talk about renewal. It is the means by which we're transformed and it gives us the opportunity to change and be different. The second thing I want you to think about is what renewing the mind. What is it to renew the mind? When we talk about the mind in uh, the noetic here in, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, what we're talking about is not our, our brain as a physical uh, structure in our body, okay? So when the, when the Bible here speaks of the mind, we're not talking about the thing you cut open and you look at or you zap, okay? What we're talking about here is our 
psychological faculty of understanding and thinking. It's our ability to reason, our ability to decide. The thing that's transformed by renewal is the way we think. It's the way we reason. It's the way we understand. And even to some extent, it's the way we emote. Our thinking changes and becomes a brand new thing in Christ. And when we give ourselves as living sacrifices, what we're giving over is not just the physical, but we're actually giving to God our mind for change. And the way that we transform ourselves, at least in some part, is, is by changing our minds. And I think this is even more emphasized when you read the phrase before it. Don't be conformed to this world. And I know that you've experienced this in your life, this difficulty of changing your mind against the pattern of the world. But I think it's one of the most significant and important things that you can cultivate while you're here at HCU. The world will not want you to follow this path of transformation. The pattern, it's very clear here in Romans 12 too, there is a pattern of the world that will drag against this transformation and this renewal. And we believe here at Heritage Christian University that your education is part of your transformation. And that when you decide to commit and give yourself as a living, holy sacrifice to God, you're saying, I'm going to also give you my mind. And I'm going to do it in this atmosphere with people who care and want you to be transformed in the right way. And when you do that, when you commit to that, when you allow your reasoning and your thinking to be developed and to be fostered by Nathan and by Jeremy and by Ed and by Bill and by others, when you do that, it will change who you are. And it will not matter if you're a garbage man or a teacher or what we hope you to be, a preacher, missionary, Bible class teacher. When you are transformed, I believe that you help other people to be transformed too. And you'll change lives. There's a scene where you remember in Dead Poets where they're all walking around in a circle and they're doing left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. And, and Professor Keating tells them that that's conformity. And he tells them to quit walking in the line. They do it all naturally. And then they all start walking around and acting crazy uh, as just a sign. And he says, we all have a great need for acceptance, but you must trust that your beliefs are your unique, your own. And uh, I would say not individually, but corporally as Christians, we need to think that way. And we'll close with uh, a little anecdote about my dad. Um, as you know, I, well, you may not know, I celebrated the, um, I didn't celebrate, but three years ago my dad died uh, on January 8th. And during the process of dad's death, um, it was really weird. Um, you know, you, you start finding the unintended blessings uh, way after it's passed. But during the, the process of his death, we knew it was coming. So we knew we had about two weeks of, of a period where we knew what was happening. So dad was, uh, dad was the consummate social media professional, um, which means he liked to share every time a squirrel ran by his back door. Um, and I'm, I'm not kidding. That's literal. Uh, we had an uh, uh, albino squirrel, um, and he liked to share his uh, sightings with everybody. But anyway, that's off the, the point. But... So I was sharing with people his decline and as things were, uh, were changing. And what ended up happening is as we shared that, we began to get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, literally almost a thousand posts to his Facebook page about the difference that he made in somebody's life. 
from being a guidance counselor at school. Now, this I just picked out a representative post, and uh, I wanted to share it with you. Um, but there were hundreds like it. Um, glad he could see through the eye-rolling teenager I was. To see what I could become. And then I came across this other post from uh, someone he knew who said, how many people really get to find out what difference they've made before they leave the earth? I want you to think about that. You don't know what this transformation will bring in your life. And more than that, you have no idea what this transformation will do for others. But I promise you, I can promise you one thing. I'm sorry. I can promise you one thing. Giving your mind to God for that transformation will be the best decision you've ever made. You remember Basil's quote. We love what we do. Why, Dennis? Because we don't know what we're doing. Because we don't know what we're doing. I submit to you that I want you to submit your mind to God for transformation. And by doing that, make your lives extraordinary.